SCP-7002, The Hungry Season. It's sometimes said that no society is more than three missed meals away from chaos. And while the veracity of such a statement is hard to say, there's no doubt that food is obviously an extremely vital part of human existence. Many wars have been fought throughout history for the purposes of food and farmland, and food scarcity continues to be an extremely unfortunate problem in many parts of the world. SCP-7002 isn't a food SCP per se, but it is about food and farming, as well as scarcity and exploitation. Most people go through their whole lives without giving much thought to actually growing food themselves, but what would happen if the entire world was forced to do so? Let's take a look. Upon accessing the document, we're first given a warning that this article describes an ongoing EK-class scorched earth event, and because we've accessed it, a cognito mole will embed within our subconscious to track our biosignature for up to 72 hours. With that, we're given the SCP itself, which possesses the Tiamat containment class, meaning that it poses an immediate threat to humanity but it could be contained with actions that would break the veil of secrecy. SCP-7002 designates an interstellar rogue comet that is believed to have entered our solar system on January 3rd, 2022. It will reach its closest point to the Sun on November 29th, and will approach within 2.1 lunar distance of Earth on December 9th, the closest approach by a near-Earth object in recorded history. Project Ricochet was set up to prevent this approach from occurring. Alongside this, through an unknown mechanism, an increasing portion of Earth has become subject to desertification as the comet approaches. So far, an estimated 48% of the planet's fertile soil has been converted to arid desert, and estimates point to a full conversion occurring either during or shortly after the comet's approach on December 9th. Other effects coinciding with this include crop blight and the spontaneous combustion and desiccation of crops, acidification and salinization of fertile soil, intercontinental dust and firestorms hitting major population centers, and the gradual collapse of the Earth's magnetosphere. These effects have worsened as the comet approaches, so needless to say, by December the planet would likely be inhospitable for human life. Spectrographic analysis has shown that the comet possesses a composition that has never been seen before in a comet of its kind. It possesses a far higher ratio of carbon to water in its tail than average, and is enriched in refined metals such as iodized copper and silicate, which are compounds not typically found in interstellar objects. Most notably, however, imaging suggests that the majority of the interior of the comet is hollow leading researchers to speculate that the object may be at least partially artificial in origin. If that wasn't all enough, there's another component to the anomaly, a recurring dream that's been experienced by an increasing portion of the human population since the comet entered our solar system. It's been classified as a class 2 cognitohazard, with an increasingly higher cognitive resistance value required to avoid experiencing the dream pattern. The dreams consist of several associated images and ideas, which include a verdant green planet of unknown position and origin, the comet itself typically floating or flying through space, and an ambiguous desire or need which is possessed by the comet and or the unknown planet. This desire is often described by victims as a wish which must be granted. The dreams also show the Sun and Earth from the comet's current location, and channels of luminous matter or energy flowing between Earth and the unknown planet. Repeated exposure to the dreams produce convictions that the comet is a benevolent force, and they appear to compel victims to work to fulfill the wish expressed in their dreams. 
Amnestics provide only temporary relief from these thoughts, as they won't stop the dreams, which will simply reintroduce these concepts. Those compelled by the dreams typically seek to grow and produce crops, particularly grains, vegetables, or other common foodstuffs, using any resources at their disposal. They won't consume these products themselves, however, but rather will simply abandon their fields before harvest, moving on to begin planting again at a new location. They will forcibly resist attempts to stop them, however, as well as being forced to harvest the crops, and will often work without regard for their own health or needs. Death by exhaustion and starvation is therefore a common outcome of the advanced stages of this affliction. We're given a description of the dream by a Foundation memetics researcher, who experienced it for three consecutive days in early January, like most of humanity. Unlike nearly all other Foundation employees, he did not possess a resistance value sufficient to resist its effects. His description reads, Three days ago, I had a dream. The next night I had it again. And again, the third night. Please, God, may I continue to have it. In the dream, there is a comet. But it is more than this. It is a celestial fireball beyond words, burning in the depths of space. It is gargantuan, grotesque, and beautiful. It is the most wonderful thing I have ever seen. The comet has traveled far, and must travel further still. I sense its struggle. It burns without end, on through the void eternal. What does it seek? I can feel that there is something, a great need unfulfilled, purpose beyond my comprehension. I yearn to help it, but know not what I can do. I am distraught, for I exist to work for the comet, and for its creators. Its creators! I see their world, so far away, so much brighter and better than my own. They who have made something so beautiful, and sent it to us. They are entitled to all that I have. Perhaps this is what I can do. Yes, they are entitled to the sweat of my brow, and to my body, and my blood, to all I have produced and can ever produce. I give it to them freely, and without regret. They smile upon me. This must mean that I am right. I can see my energy the spirit of my world flowing to them. I have not toiled in vain, for they will benefit from that which I make. I have granted their wish. This thought gives me peace, but it does not sate my desire, for I have a wish also. I wish to burn as it does, to burn with the comet, and to give of myself until there is no more. It belongs to me as surely as I belong to it. I am what it deserves, and I will burn with it. It is mine. It is mine and I am theirs. And it is coming for me. We're next given an addendum going over all of the environmental effects of the anomaly in more detail. It's described as a Class IX thaumaturgic envirohazard but the Foundation doesn't know how or why it's doing these things, if a reason even exists. The most major issue is the crop blight, as the anomaly causes rapid withering of crops, especially those near harvest. The crops appear to desiccate spontaneously over a period of three to seven days, though the effect has been observed to occur in as little as 90 minutes. Crops with high nutritional value, such as soy and corn, are the most affected. 
In the first month after the comet entered the solar system, it blighted a total of 20 million metric tons of agricultural product, and that number has been steadily increasing every month. In July, it blighted an estimated 250 million cubic tons, which is approximately 71% of the total output of all of the farms on the planet combined. Crops produced by those affected by the dreams experience blight and withering at a greatly increased rate. One wheat farmer that Foundation researchers interviewed about the issue described waking up one morning to a rustling sound, like sticks in a high wind. When they looked out at the fields, they saw every plant standing on end, like they were tied with strings. The stalks were dancing around and shaking, bumping into each other, and the sound they made was bizarre, like twigs clattering around in a cart. Also, every plant was letting off mist like a hot kettle, and by the end of the day, each of them was bone dry. First the wheat turned yellow, then brown, then gray, and black. It's just dust now, and the farmer says that his son picked some up and hasn't been able to get it off his hand after three days of scrubbing. The second issue is the fertility of the soil itself as the anomaly depletes the land of vital components, including potassium, phosphorus, and zinc, as well as binding agents, rendering the soil into dusty, granular chunks which break apart on contact. Salinization has been recorded more rarely, and acidification has occurred in at least one case. The soil is being rendered infertile at an exponential rate as the comet nears, with 14,000 acres of land being ruined in January to nearly 206 million acres in July alone. It's noted that soil impacted by the comet should not be handled with bare hands. Third is an overall drought, currently affecting 70% of Earth's surface. The comet appears to be disrupting rainfall and weather patterns depriving the soil of moisture on a continental scale. The drought is preventing desertified soil from recovering, and drastically increases the risk of fire and dust storms. Major population centers in 96 nations have been under storm watch for at least six weeks, while an estimated 988 million acres of forest have burned to date. Finally is the disruption of the magnetosphere, with the comet weakening the Earth's magnetic field by a factor of three. The relationship of this effect to the comet's other effects is unknown, but the disruption has significantly impacted the planet's ability to resist solar radiation and other disruptive phenomena, imperiling global technology and satellite systems. These factors have led the Foundation to coordinate its response entirely using ground-based communication systems, slowing response by 17%. Though the comet affects many aspects of day-to-day -day life, mass starvation is the Foundation's primary concern. Approximately 2.5 billion people are currently experiencing food scarcity due to the anomaly, and many more refuse to feed themselves because of the compulsion of the dreams. That leads us right into the Foundation's plan to stop this, Project Ricochet. Ricochet is a joint Foundation Global Occult Coalition effort to deflect the comet from its current course prior to it reaching near Earth. Should the project achieve success, it may preserve as much as 33% of the planet's fertile soil from desertification, which would be enough to enable the continued survival of the human race. The primary mission of the project is to deploy a team of agents directly onto the comet to implant experimental technology. This technology, consisting of prototype matter displacement systems, would redirect the comet away from the Earth and into a collision course with the Sun. These systems require delicate handling, and may not easily be deployed remotely. One would imagine that the Foundation will send a team of trained personnel rather than a crew of misfit oil drillers. 
Should this mission fail, emergency measures will be prepared to destroy the comet prior to its closest approach. These measures include a heavy weapons barrage from a second generation high energy railgun system that's been developed for deployment beyond Earth, the high energy concentration interplanetary railgun. The Joint Task Force for Ricochet began operations on October 1st, when the comet was 674 million kilometers from Earth, and 48% of fertile soil on the planet has been converted. On October 18th, dust storms caused significant damage to the infrastructure of southern Australia, and multiple Foundation sites lose contact. By the 23rd, the launch vehicle for the space mission and the displacement systems are near completion, as the railgun begins relocation to L4 Lagrange Point to intercept the comet, should the primary mission fail. 51% of the fertile soil on Earth has now been converted. A few days later, the launch vehicle and systems are complete just as widespread acidification occurs in the Indian subcontinent, due in part to over-farming by victims of the dreams. Mass starvation is expected within eight weeks, and the comet is now 605 million kilometers from Earth. On November 1st, the primary team for Project Ricochet departs in the launch vehicle, and using subluminal warp, they're expected to arrive at the comet in 16 hours. While the activation of the displacement systems should be pretty quick, the team is prepared with supplies sufficient to last six weeks, as well as equipped with advanced telepathic shielding. 16 hours later, they drop out of warp near the surface of the comet, and despite the telepathic shielding, the team reports immediate nausea and lethargy but advises that they can proceed as planned. An hour later, they touch down on the surface of the comet, seemingly resulting in 16% of mankind experiencing a sudden loss of consciousness. There's also heavy distortion in communications channels. The team sends some photographs of the surface, showing multiple massive advanced devices, although their purpose is unclear. A few minutes later, acid rainfall begins falling over 71% of North America, along with magnetic field distortions across Earth. The unconscious portion of the human population enters into spontaneous REM sleep. Ten minutes later, the team reports that the displacement systems have been placed and powered on, with a timer set for five minutes. They proceed towards the evacuation vehicle, but two minutes later report the loss of two team members, including the lead, although heavy distortion prevents them from communicating what happened. One minute later, all communication with the team is lost, followed by the monitors in the displacement systems reporting that they've been manually disabled. The Foundation is unable to re-establish contact with the team until 30 minutes later, when a single, continuous transmission from the team is received. The message is heavily cognitohazardous, and consists of a single phrase being repeated 1,136 times before the radio channels are closed. The message has been redacted from the log. The following day, the primary mission of Project Ricochet was declared a failure with the comet 550 million kilometers away and 54% of the planet's soil having been converted. The individuals that were rendered unconscious wake up at this point, each reporting a modified version of the anomalous dream. In this one, victims witness the primary team for Ricochet launch their ship and approach the comet. The affected individuals all explicitly identify the team and the SCP Foundation as hostile. This new version of the dream now affects everyone when they sleep, immediately causing a high-level broken masquerade scenario. Two weeks later, the railgun system reaches the L4 Lagrange point, with the comet now 363 million kilometers away. On November 19th, wildfires suddenly break out near Site 02, with the cause being unknown. 
On November 21st, the dreams increase in strength, with all individuals possessing a resistance value below 20 now experiencing cognitohazardous effects, including two-thirds of Foundation staff. The comet is 254 million kilometers away now, and 60% of fertile soil has been converted. The Foundation is at this point continuing to try to feed most of the population, but since most of them view the Foundation as a hostile organization now, they are continuing to attack any supply lines. The Foundation continues to look into alternative ways to transport food, but Mass starvation progresses in most population centers. On November 29th, the comet reaches its closest approach to the Sun, and is now within 1 million kilometers of the railgun's effective range. Unfortunately, the dream changes again, now transmitting awareness of the railgun, as well as the exact location of Foundation Site 02. As the comet enters range of the railgun, its usage is authorized, and targeting coordinates are transmitted. Three minutes later, power outages are reported at multiple sites, including Site 02. Numerous figures are also sighted in the nearby forest, rapidly approaching the site. Emergency power systems then come online, allowing the railgun to begin fire calibration. The automated defenses for Site-02 trigger as an estimated 17,000 individuals emerge from the forest boundary, and 4,000 of them manage to make it to the perimeter wall. The railgun then finally finishes calibration and fires, but misses, with an investigation confirming that incorrect coordinates were sent by Project Ricochet Central Command. The Central Command transmits a cognitohazardous message to all Foundation sites within range, and the assailants manage to breach the perimeter of Site-02. The railgun fails to begin recalibration for a second shot, and Site-02 is declared lost. With that, the secondary mission of Project Ricochet is also declared a failure, and the Foundation begins to look for any alternatives as the comet is now 133 million kilometers away. By the following day, most of the remaining Foundation sites have been overtaken by attacks from affected civilians, while the GOC and other allied groups of interest are either unresponsive or hostile. By December 5th, 70% of fertile soil has been converted. Almost all human life is affected by the dreams, including 98% of Foundation staff, and the comet is 49 million kilometers away. By December 8th, satellite imaging suggests nearly all remaining landmass has been taken over by victims for use as farmland, with continental scale dust storms complicating any further imaging. Site 01 is also overtaken by attacks. December 9th finally arrives, with the Earth's magnetic field down to one one-hundredth of its original strength. Solar radiation disables global communication and positioning systems, and the entirety of the human population is believed to be under compulsion by the dreams. The comet continues to approach within under a million kilometers from Earth, but when it comes within a half hour of its closest approach point, Two members of the Project Ricochet primary team suddenly re-establish radio contact. These were the two that were thought to be killed first upon their initial landing. They attempt to hail Site-02, but are given only an automated response. Seven minutes later, monitoring systems indicate that the displacement units placed by the primary team have now been reactivated, followed by the launch of the team's return vehicle on the surface of the comet. The displacement systems then activate, displacing the comet into the sun, neutralizing it entirely. Shortly after, the first rainfall in 16 weeks occurred on Earth. The two team members returned to Earth that same day, after surviving on the surface of the comet for 39 days. After a two-week quarantine, they were debriefed, 
and they revealed that the other two team members attacked them shortly after they placed the displacement units. The team lead remarks that they had been acting weird since they dropped out of warp, and he suspects their telekill was faulty, a substance designed to inhibit psychic signals. The other member says that team member Charlie had all of their weapons, and she got him pretty good with her knife, but his suit saved him. The lead says that they fought back, but the other two were supernaturally strong, with a punch from Delta feeling like getting hit by a car. The two managed to escape down a tunnel, but the others sealed the entrance, so they decided to explore the interior. They knew that the railgun was going to blow the comet apart in about a month, but they also felt that it was likely that the secondary plan would be sabotaged as well, so they decided to explore and see if they couldn't figure something else out. The interviewer remarks on how they would have died when the railgun destroyed the comet, but they already figured they were dead anyways, with the other two likely going to destroy the return vehicle, and even if not, they had the guns. After the railgun failed to eliminate the comet, however, Alpha and Bravo reassessed their situation, realizing that they could use their remaining backup oxygen canister as a makeshift explosive to free themselves from the cave. They managed to do so, but this left them with only a few remaining hours of air. Alpha says that they didn't know what to expect when they got back to the surface, but from underground, they got the impression that Charlie and Delta had been making something, as they heard a lot of scraping and digging sounds. Apparently, Charlie and Delta had spent their time compulsively attempting to make a farm on the comet's surface. They estimate that the two had converted as much as 35% of the comet's surface using their bare hands alone, digging neat rows and dropping pebbles in the dirt like seeds. Everything they could see was covered in these makeshift fields, and Bravo remarks that being so close to the comet, they must have been impacted severely. The interviewer asks them if they were able to overpower the two, and after a brief pause, Alpha says that the digging had done a lot of damage to them, and it wasn't much of a fight. Remarkably, the two had not damaged the return vehicle, or the MDS units, allowing Alpha and Bravo to complete the mission with only 15 minutes to spare. Well down in the cave system, however, they managed to take a number of photographs, although Alpha says that he's not really sure what they mean, but perhaps others can make something of them. Analysis of prior imaging and the photographs suggests that the comet was created by an intelligent, non-human race for the purpose of resource gathering. The key evidence for this includes the hollow interior, the synthesized metallic composition, and most importantly, the presence of numerous mechanical systems and components. The comet possessed multiple gigaton scale energy collection and storage systems of unknown make and purpose although they do bear similarity to another SCP, which suggests the capacity to remotely harvest chemical potential energy. The comet also possessed a number of components for long distance travel and communication with unknown extrasolar entities. Foundation exophysicists speculate that the comet was intentionally directed towards a developed planet, and that its cognitohazards were intended both to prevent obstruction of its goals, and to compel its victims to produce additional harvest. But further research is ongoing. As for Earth, the comet managed to desertify 75% of the surface before being neutralized, but researchers believe that the majority of this soil can be restored within 15 to 20 years. Furthermore, the conversion of much of the remaining soil to farmland by the victims has had the unexpected benefit of providing food to areas that previously imported it. All's well that ends well, I suppose. Except that on December 31st, most of the population of Earth experienced an additional instance of the dream. The origin of this one is unknown but all who experienced it reported seeing a verdant green planet in the distance. Ahead of it, 
traveling away into space is a group of at least 200 comets. Upon waking, all those who experienced the dream recall hearing the phrase, Grant our wish, spoken in their native language. So, we have some sort of super-advanced alien civilization capable of producing loads of these artificial comets, and they send them across the galaxy to developed planets. They do this in order to gather resources, specifically chemical potential energy, largely from crops and fertile soil. They accomplish this through two separate effects. One is draining both the soil and any plants of their energy, and two is the cognitohazardous dreams that compel the population of the planet to assist them in their goal by producing as much as possible before dying off. By the time the comet arrives then to pick up the last bits of energy, the entire planet will be little more than a used up husk, with no one alive. It presumably then just returns course to where it came from to drop off the energy. Chances are this often works pretty well for them, and would have worked for them here, but the Foundation got pretty lucky and managed to stop it by sending the comet into the sun. Now however they've angered a bunch of advanced aliens who are going to send 200 more comets to deal with this pesky planet. Odds are that this is a pretty bleak ending, as the Foundation barely managed to stop one of the comets, and it's unlikely the planet will have any real recovery before the 200 comets start affecting it again. The Foundation is crafty though, and now they have forewarning, so anything's possible. Worse comes to worse, they might just have to abandon Earth and go to a different universe, timeline, or planet. Obviously there's some metaphors here, for the nature of food scarcity and exploitation of labor, but there's also something humorous about the idea of a shooting star wishing on you rather than the other way around. Overall, I don't think the Foundation did anything foolish here, but as usual, sometimes you eat the bear, and sometimes the bear eats you.